Hey, everybody. How's it going? It's good to see you. Um, my name's Brian. I get to be the executive pastor here. If you are newer to our community or if you're brand new, you are most welcome here. You've heard that a lot, and we just want to keep saying it because it really is true. If you're someone who is pursuing Jesus, uh, then you are most welcome here. If you're someone who is interested in Jesus... Uh, but maybe not pursuing, then you are most welcome here. If you're someone who's just trying to figure this whole thing out, you are most welcome here. If you're someone here who was drugged here by someone who was actually pursuing Jesus, and you're like, I'm not sure why I'm here, you are most welcome as well. Today's conversation uh, that we're going to be having can potentially feel like a very insider conversation. It can, very, it can feel like very much of a, okay, this is just for like the Jesus people kind of thing, but what I want you to know is that yes, it's for Jesus people, but if there are some of you who are trying to figure this whole thing out, I want you to know that you're most welcome into this conversation, both to critique, think critically about what you know Jesus followers to have said and done regarding this topic, and then stick around long enough and hold us to what we're saying. And maybe in the process, you're going to figure out some of the things that you may agree with, or, or, or you can even challenge some of those things, and all of that stuff is welcome here. And so while there will be a lot of this where it feels like, okay, if I'm not a follower of Jesus, then this really isn't for me, I absolutely want you to stay engaged. Take notes. As Sharon said, uh, let's go to coffee. I love hanging out and talking about this stuff uh, in more of a personal way, and I love going to coffee. Uh, my favorite coffee shop, um, well, it's not Starbucks, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, we can do that later, too. Um, Okay, so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Um, So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it there. Open your phone or whatever. Um, I don't usually give messages like sermons titles uh, just because it, it, it rarely works out for me or whatever. But as... The, as I got to studying, the longer that I was in this, the title just came to me, and it's actually out of a movie, uh, a Disney animated film, Up. And so if you've seen the film, then there's the early scenes where you have this little girl and this little boy, and she is encouraging this little boy that adventure is out there. And he puts on the goggles, and they kind of do the whole thing. Uh, and then he gets old and cranky and, uh, and, and decides that adventure isn't something that he wants to be a part of. And there's like a whole thing. The movie isn't very good. That may be like, uh, I, 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 I expected that response. Th- thank you, Scott. Uh, it's, it's really not that good. Uh, uh, they actually, they don't live inside the world that they created. And like, we can go to coffee and talk about that too, Okay. There are some phenomenal moments, and it's also not a very good movie. Um, so <laughs> I'm so happy right now. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so after you kind of move on from up, what I'd like for you to start thinking through is I'd like for you to think through what your life might have been like sometime around 60 AD in Palestine. Everybody got that? All right. So think with me. Let's say that you were a Jewish family, and let's say that you were actually at the event called Pentecost, where all of a sudden people were from all these different languages were able to understand one another. And there was this person that got up and said some stuff and said that this was actually all about God, and it was all about this guy named Jesus, um, who, who we've already sung about. Uh, he, he, he died a death, but then he rose again. And that there was a way for us to be able to be in relationship with this God, with this person, Jesus, who actually wasn't around anymore because they went into this other space and said that they were going to prepare a place and that we would get to come along as well and be an ultimate ongoing relationship. And let's just say that you were listening to all of this and you were actually from somewhere else and you heard all this stuff and you decided to become what would have been known in the day as a follower of the way or a follower of Jesus, and that now you've raised your children, and, and we're moving on about, you know, about a few years after this, so 20, 30 years after this, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on in society. You've been trying to raise your kids in this stuff, and you've been telling stories all along the way of what you know to be true about Jesus, from other people who actually were with Jesus, Or maybe what you know to be true now based on the letters that are starting to be circulated and written about different spaces. And you've been meeting in this this home for a number of weeks, a number of months, a number of years. Or maybe 
Maybe you weren't part of that initial crew, but you've been brought in along the way because of some miraculous things that have happened. Maybe someone prayed for you and you were actually healed. Maybe you were in prison at some point and you heard these crazy stories about some of these prisoners who were followers of the way and what they did while they were both in prison and once they got out. And it was so compelling that you're like, I have to know more. And in this context is really where I want us to have our vision as we look backward in history. When Jesus was still around, so this would have been, again, about 30 years prior, because there's a lot of stuff that Jesus wants to talk specifically about here and do that begins to set up what could have been experienced here. And then I want us to think about what it gets to look like right now in South Orange County, 2023. So if you've got your Bible, what we want to do is we're going to chip along through a few verses. I'll have a couple things to say about it. And then we're going to talk way meta. Um, like, uh, instead of like digging into all the intricacies of this, I feel like I want to talk bigger picture and talk about some of the other facets that are going on because this is just a, it's a fascinating passage. And again, the longer that I was in it, I just kept coming back to this idea of adventure being out there. So Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. We should probably pause right here. Um, Jesus gives them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, he has been doing this, and they've been following him for a little while and watching this all happen. And now, apparently in chapter 10, he gives them the authority to go and to do all the stuff that he's been up to. Verse 2, these are the names of the 12 apostles, and I want to pause here as well. We're not going to do, I promise we're going to speed up, because I did say we're going to go meta, but um, there's, a, there's a couple of really cool things that are happening right now. Uh, Matthew, for the first time, is about to list out the 12 apostles. Up to this point, we've, we've been hanging out with about five of them, and then in verse 10, uh, chapter 10, he moves to telling everybody who's in the crew that's getting ready to go do some crazy stuff. And the word apostle is actually used here for the first time. And this word ends up being really important for the rest of our time. This word uh, can be translated in a couple different ways. One way would be an ambassador, someone who actually goes on behalf of, basically somebody who would be an emissary. And so, and so Jesus and Matthew is helping us understand that when Jesus is giving them authority, that he's making them emissaries of his, emissaries of the kingdom of God. And he's going to talk to them about that. But there's also another way that it can be translated that would apply for all of his disciples, all of the people who were followers of the way, and even us today, and it would be sent ones, ones who are sent, ones who are sent out to do a thing. Well, what are they sent to do? Well, let's keep going into verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of Samaria. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So the authority that we find in verse 1, that Jesus has given them to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness, looks like healing sick people, raising dead people, cleansing people who have leprosy, driving out demons. And he says, because you've been given this authority, give it away. A lot here. So it's interesting that he talks first about going just to the Jewish communities. And a lot of scholars have looked at this, and there are a lot of different things that are, that are happening. One, it fulfills some Old Testament prophecy. And then Paul, one of the key writers of the New Testament, helps us frame out what's actually taking place here when he says that, that actually it's first to come to Israel and to the Jewish people and then to be taken abroad. And so what Jesus is actually saying here is, I want this done in this fashion right now. The other piece that seems really helpful with this for me as I was kind of reading and studying is a lot of scholars look at this and they go, these guys had been with Jesus for a while and Jesus had been modeling what, was going, what, was, what they were about to do, but they weren't ready to do it outside of their own kind of cultural context. They would have needed to do it in ways that the people that they were with, they, they, 
they shared a commonality of language, and I don't mean like they spoke the same language, but just they had the, they had the same background. They had the same basic understandings of how life worked, of religious components and all of these different things. And so Jesus basically, at this point, is sending out these 12 men on a short-term mission trip. And then they get to go and they get to do all of this crazy stuff. But before they do it, they actually are going to proclaim it first. And one of the things that I love about this passage and that we often talk about when we talk specifically about the kingdom of God, Jesus says, as you go, proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. Now, if you've been with us in our Matthew series, this is a refrain that continually comes up that Jesus has been saying. All of these times, he'll say it, and then he does something about it. Or he does something about it, and he says, this is what's happening. The kingdom of God has come near. And all throughout Matthew, and specifically in this passage, there is a way in which proclamation and demonstration go together. Okay, so we proclaim the kingdom of God is near, and then there are demonstrations of it that we get to participate in, that we get to act on. And so what Jesus is saying here, say it, and then do something about it. Okay, and, and, and again, I want to just plug back what we were talking about before with, the, uh, with preventing gun violence. This is a way where we get to say the kingdom of God is such that people don't die by guns. Let's have a conversation about that, and let's do something about it. And we get to be part of both. And so in this way, he is saying, here's what the kingdom of God in its demonstration is going to look like because I've given you authority. It's going to look like sick people getting well, dead people coming back to life, and all of these other facets. So then we move to verse 9. Do not get any gold or silver or copper or take, uh, or, or take in your belt no bag for the journey or extra shirts or sandals or staff for the worker is, is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person to stay in their home until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it's not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave the home or the town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Okay, <laughs> a lot going on right here. And again, we're going to stay meta, and so I just want to touch on a couple components, um, and then we're going to move on and for sure uh, do some study on this stuff. I've got some great resources to provide you uh, in, your, in your hour a day with Jesus. This may be a really good passage for you to go, wow, I really want to unpack what's going on there. Uh, we have some good stuff regarding that. Or again, let's go to coffee. Here's a couple of things. One is, this is not prescriptive, okay? Now, there's a hermeneutic method. So, so hermeneutics is basically a, the, the way we study the Bible. There's a hermeneutical method that actually talks about paying attention to, is this prescriptive or descriptive? Or, or is something being prescribed right now that we're all supposed to go do, or is it just describing what got done? This is 100% a case of a descriptive nature. So what Jesus is not doing is saying, all of y'all go do this, and then what we're supposed to do, go, we're supposed to go do this, literally, exactly, okay? There was so much cultural context, and again, this is all the stuff we're not going to get into, but there were other traveling evangelists, uh, the Essenes, there, was the, there were different groups of people that were traveling around doing a similar thing, and what he's doing is saying, what I want you to do is to be distinctive from the other traveling evangelists, but I also want you to lean into just the cultural more of the day. And part of it was when someone came into town, somebody would let you just stay at their place. That's probably not going to happen around here. And if you're inviting someone into your home that just kind of shows up and says, hey, I just want to talk about God to people. Um, like, can I stay at your house? Maybe, maybe not, okay? Uh, but again, so, so again, this is not prescriptive for what we're supposed to do. It's descriptive specific to the context and to a whole bunch of other cultural facets that Jesus is trying to do. Now, all this stuff about shaking the dust off your feet, that has to do with, with what would happen in Jewish culture when people would walk through Gentile spaces or basically non-Jewish spaces. And again, so much in there to talk about later. And then lastly, the one thing I just want to at least hit on is it would be more bearable, bearable, bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that specifically has to do with an understanding that Sodom and Gomorrah would not have had Jesus in the context that they would now. And so there was a way in which the people who were going and hearing about Jesus and interfacing with Jesus actually had more 
information to be able to make a decision to follow than Sodom and Gomorrah did. So that's kind of what's going on. So those are, those are some of the pieces that go along with it. What I want to do, though, is I want to kind of pull out of the passage just for a second, and I want to talk about this idea of short-term missions. And if it's not prescriptive, then it is descriptive of some stuff, and so what is it descriptive of? I've had the pleasure of going on so many short-term mission trips, leading them, being a participant, and all of this stuff, and there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, some of you right now are, uh, are hopefully going to be going to Guatemala in just a little while, and you've been through an interview process, and then after the interview process, you're going to start learning about the culture and, and what it is that you're going to do versus not do, and how is it that we as Americans can come up and like really... Uh, do weird stuff and not even realize it. And so we want to be, we want to be gentle and humble and all of these different pieces. And in short-term missions, that's kind of what's going on. We understand that we've been given authority by Jesus to be able to go to proclaim the kingdom and to demonstrate the kingdom. And we do it inside the context where we get to go. Um, probably, though, the thing that I love most about short-term missions is I think differently. I act differently, I pray differently. I am so much quicker to prayer when I'm on a short-term mission trip, when I'm in a foreign land where maybe I don't speak the language, where I'm reliant on so many other people. I'm so quick to pray. I'm so, I'm so quick to go, God, what are you up to right now? There's a lot of distractions that get stripped away in those environments that help you be laser-focused in what's going on. And I was just thinking through, like, you know, what's some of the stuff that I've experienced? And, um, we were in Mexico, and uh, we had been invited down uh, to help build a church in Monterey. And so we had done everything to get everything set up and all of that. And the big day came when we were supposed to pour concrete. This was going to be kind of the final day. We had been looking forward to this all week. We had been busting rocks and breaking every tool that they had to try and get these holes dug, to be able to set foundational pieces and all this stuff. This was our shining moment. And just as we get ready to start making the concrete, the water in the entire area gets shut off. <laughs> and so we're like, well, this is a drag. And somebody said, we should just pray. Now, I mean, I mean, cool, yeah, we're on a mission trip, and like that's the Jesus thing to do, and all of that stuff. But again, those are, these, those are the moments where it's just like, well, yeah, let's just pray. Let's just pray that the water gets turned back on. And so we said this simple little prayer, God, we would really love to like, get to do kind of the thing. Like, we've been working so hard, it'd be really nice to be able to, to walk away from a completed project and all that. Can you just turn the water back on, please? And as we said the prayer, um, over on the street, we heard the squeal of brakes and looked up, and it was a water truck. And um, <laughs> we all kind of look at each other and start laughing. And um, he, he was on his lunch break, uh, and it just chosen there to stop for his lunch break. And so we walk over and say, hey, we've been digging holes. We want to make concrete. We don't have water. And he's like, I got all the water you need. And so we got to make concrete. I've been in the Bolivian rainforest flying in a three-seat Cessna plane over three consecutive waterfalls spilling into each other, literally flying about 50 feet over the top of the canopy. It was terrifying and amazing. I was in a Ugandan hospital after a bus wreck where someone in our group had actually broken their back and was going to have to be airlifted out to another country to be able to get taken care of, along with multiple other peoples. I've been in Northern Ireland debating Catholic and Protestant concerns and how does Jesus fit into all of that. I've been to Guatemala playing soccer with kids, and I'm terrible at soccer, reenacting David and Goliath. And, and doing it in a cross-cultural environment where we don't understand anything that they're saying and they can't understand anything that we're saying. Praying for people who are sick, climbing up mountains and going into people's homes. You saw a bunch of kids on the wall over here being able to meet these kids that we had been praying for for years and actually sponsoring and helping get education and health and to learn about Jesus and then meeting them and saying, I see you. I've been in a Palestinian refugee camp and heard stories of what it's like to experience hopelessness, depression, fatigue, exhaustion, sadness, loss. Adventure is out there. 
And so, yes, it's out there in short-term missions, and it's out there in all these other ways, but it's also when we leave this room and go to one of these places to eat lunch when we're done today. And I want you to recognize that if we have a mindset of being sent out, like we do on a short-term mission trip, if I had that mentality, my lunch would be way more adventurous. My tomorrow would be way more adventurous if I am thinking I've been sent out. I'm actually on a cross-cultural expedition right now. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God, and I proclaim the kingdom is here, and then I demonstrate it in these ways that hopefully will confuse people because they're, wait, you should be mad right now, but you're actually showing grace. You should hate this person, but you're actually showing love. And in all of these ways, adventure is right in front of us always. And this is where we get to talk about one step. So I want to invite Janet up. You can say hi to Janet. Janet and I, uh, for those of you who don't know, we've been married almost 25 years, and we talk all the time about her one steps because she has like a million one step moments in her every day. And so I said, I feel like you're the best person I know to talk about one step moments. Um, so what are, what are some of your adventurous one step moments or even not so adventurous one step moments? But it's just like, I don't know, this is, this is my proclamation and demonstration of the kingdom of God. Okay. That's a big question. Um, well, okay, let's see, I'll have to, sorry, I have Mary Poppin pockets, so <laughs> this is where I live. Um, so this is my badge for work. So I work at a school, and um, I work for the district, so I go to all sorts of different schools. So this gets me everywhere. It tells people that I am allowed to be there. Um, I have a key, gets me everywhere but the principal's office, because I've tried. And... Um, <laughs> It helps people know, like, this is who I am. This pocket, let's see, or well, maybe it's still this pocket. I really had all this planned, but uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I literally have four pockets, and I have things for children that I end up at home. In this pocket, I have my ambassador tag that we got to church. Um, I keep it can in you, my car. Can you explain that for people who may not know? I'm, I'm going to. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so, see, this is, this is, yeah. Um, so we got this at church. This is Oak House Ambassador, and I'm going to read it. It's a, it, on this side, it says Ambassador, a noun. Um, it says, let's see, on authorized representative or messenger. That's what ambassador means in the dictionary. Um, our, the, we take ours from 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are, ambas we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, and through God, we are, making, we are making his appeal through us. I can barely read it, Chad. I feel like you. There we go. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so I read this every day, and it's kind of a, the verse itself, like, I like the flowery verses, like, from the messenger that just are going, oh, clear cut, got it, done. So this one I have to read, and I have to read it a lot, and I have to read it every morning so I can just go, I am, I am going to work. I am going to wherever I'm getting out of my car. I'm going there on Christ's behalf. And so, therefore, this is who I am no matter what, whether I have my badge on at school, whether I'm going into Starbucks, whether I'm, which I do sometimes, um, I, whether I'm at Walmart, but wherever I'm at, I am ambassadors of Christ. I carry that with me, um, and that's my, part of my identity on who I am. So my one step has been, for the first time um, when we started the one step, it was just reading this. Really simple, wasn't difficult. I wasn't reading it and then going and going, who wants to know Jesus? And who wants to come to church with me? Because you think that's like the final goal of our one step. We think that the steps have to be either gigantic or really fast. And the Lord was just telling me, this is your step, is to read this every day to know who I am in you so that you can be me there, if that makes sense. And um, so it's to listen. It's to watch. It's to pay attention. What's the environment I'm in? Who are the people I'm around? Is today a day that I need to focus on the adults in the room who are broken and tired and frustrated and stressed? Is it to focus on the special needs kids I work with who are all of those and don't even know how to express that? Is it the parents who are dropping off their kids for just a breath of air so they can go run and get their groceries done because they can't go anywhere else when they get home? Is, I mean, who is it that I need to be Jesus to that day? And I always ask very specifically, and I say, just help me be who you need me to be today. And I get back into the car, and most of the time I'm like, oh, I don't think I did a very good job. But it's an everyday step that I have to make. 
And so then after a while, I felt the Lord was saying, like, it's okay for you to take another step if you're ready. And so my next step, and this was months later, granted. So I built relationships. I let people know as much as I possibly could. I reacted differently to situations around. Um, I have my, the psych at the school, she always tells me, she says, you're so calm. Nothing gets to you. And I'm like, my stomach is going, yes, it is. <laughs> and my migraine is killing me when I get home. But it's saying, like, I don't let the things that should get to me get to me um, in, in an external way. And so um, I said, well, I was like, and, I, and when people ask those questions, you're like, hmm, well, you just opened a door for me. So I just said, you know, it's something that I have to pray about every day. I say, I pray about it for it. I pray when I leave. And she's like, well, that's really cool. Again, that's all I did. I didn't jump in and go, hey, let's talk. I just said, this is who I am. So she knows that now. So now I have accountability. Now she knows I'm praying. Um, and all of a sudden, that puts me just a little different than what I need to be, which also helps me be a light better. Yeah. So the next step, though, if I'm getting to that now, is that now um, on the Mondays, because this is a practical step. So every Monday, I come in and I talk to my, my coworkers. I, I work in four classrooms. I wander around. I train. I assist. I go to gen ed. I go to special ed. I just wander all around the school wherever they need me. And I answer the 50 texts of SOS or come help me. And kids screaming and a kid's in the girl's bathroom, whatever it is. And um, so I just um, talk to all these people that I see and I ask them what they did for the weekend. And then we have a general conversation. They tell me, normally they ask me what I did for the weekend. And I always end, I talk about what I did, whether it was something or nothing. And then I go, and Sunday I had church. I go to church. And I said, and then that way, I, if I go to church on Sunday, then I can make it to Monday. And then I can go through the whole week. I said, that's how I'm refreshed. And then again, accountability. I'm a churchgoer, and I pray. So no longer am I just somebody that pops in and does an okay job and stay calm. I am a different, I, I am seen differently for who those people are um, or how they see me, whether they see me in a good light or a bad light. I mean, some people are like, oh, you're a churchgoer. Okay, well, now I got to be careful how I swear. Now I got to be careful what I do and what I say. She's going to judge me. That's not on me. I do not have to worry about what they think of me. But what I have to worry about is how I act and how I treat them and how I treat others around them. So the accountability is on me, but how they feel about me is not. But again, I'm carrying the light. So the, um, the thing that I think I, I want to do the most is to be there when people need me, is to be there when they're talking. And um, a few years ago... It was actually probably about 10 years ago when I started working. I got to know some girls really well. We, ha we worked together for a long time, and um, they were all much younger than me, and, um, and we talked a lot. We had a lot of time to talk. And I remember one of them was coming to me for marriage problems, and she was just really struggling. And so I just said, I was like, you know what? I said, I will pray for you. And I said, I really will. And she said, wow, thanks. And then the next day I told her, I said, I was praying for you, and I said, I just, I said, I have no advice, but this is what I'm thinking. And I just kind of told her a little bit of, I think it was just like, um, just listen to him. Is he struggling? Is he, because she, he was really struggling with some things. And I said, just listen to him. So she was like, okay, great. The next time that she came over, she's like, we talked some more, and she was asking me about my life more. And I said, well, I'm a pastor's, my, I'm a Christian, my husband's a pastor. And she was like, you're a pastor's wife? And my first thought was, oh, no. Like, <laughs> And she said, that's really surprising. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and then um, she said, I've never met a pastor wife like you. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I am in so much trouble. And she said, she was like, I just had this image or this idea of what that was. And she said, and she said, I think you've changed that for me because you're normal. She goes, and you're like, you're like me. She said, because you go through rough things just like I do. She's like, you just do it differently, I guess. And I was like, I guess, yeah, and you know, and we were able to talk, but that moment really made a difference to me on saying whether or not you're a pastor's wife or you work in a church or anything, if you're a Christian, I, I really want, when I tell somebody that, when I tell somebody I go to church, or when I tell somebody I'm a Jesus follower, or I just tell them I'm a Christian, I don't, I want them to be surprised for the good things, yeah. not for the bad things. I don't want them to go, well, that does not match up what you do every day. I want them to come and be like, oh, that makes total sense. Or, oh, like, you mean you can be normal? You can have this kind of job? You can, like, work like this? You can even talk like this? It's, it's okay? And it is. It's okay. And so that step to me is important in just saying I want to reflect because I wanted to quit for many years, like for probably four or five years. I was like, this is it. This is my last year. 
I'm getting old, I'm, I can't handle it, the children, you know, I'm like, I don't like getting beat up, I don't like, you know, and all these kind of things. And everybody coming in is younger, and I remember just going, Lord, it just feels like sometimes these places are dark, and, I'm, and I'm, it's wearing me out, like it's draining me emotionally. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was like, well, <laughs> if it's so dark, and you're taking me every day, why would you want to take the light out of a dark place? That's where I have to be. Mm -hmm. And if you're my light, then stop it. Like that, that, stop acting like I don't need you there. Stop acting like I'm not, I'm going to refresh you. I'm going to bring you people you need. I'm going to bring you encouragement. He's like, but until I'm ready to bring, to add a new light so that you can leave, that's fine. But he's like, not yet. And so this year has been a really clear reminder that my, that um, I'm needed there mm -hmm. for a reason, whatever it is, even if I don't know it yet, I need it for a reason. And um, I, I got to know her mom really well this year, working with her child. And they no longer go to our school, but she still texts me. And she's like, I miss you. She's like, you were the one face that I just wanted to see every day in the morning and one face I wanted to see in the night in, when, I, when you dropped your, my child off. And she was like, and I felt like there was hope for my child and hope for my future. And she said, and, and she's a Christian. So she said, and I know it was because she was getting Jesus at school and she was getting Jesus at home. And I thought, you know what? Most parents don't know that, but most people don't come to work and think that they're getting Jesus. Um, so be Jesus. They don't have to know it, but do it anyway, because that's what God's calling us to do. And it's even just, again, being a small light in a dark place and just taking, again, my steps are not big. Again, I don't go in there. I don't preach. I don't talk people down when they start saying bad things. I don't say, that's wrong, this is wrong, this is right. I don't do that kind of stuff because that's not what Jesus did. <laughs> I mean, really, it's not. I mean, if you read the Bible, he listened. He brought people along. He sat with them. He was like, let's go to dinner. Let's talk. I want to see you. Everyone's hating you. Let's go on a walk. It's that kind of stuff. And I think if we can just be that, then I think that is how we can be true ambassadors and carry that into our workplace and our life and our Starbucks. I do have to tell you, I fail sometimes. Okay, and most of you know I'm pretty TMI, which means too much information, which means I share way more Wait, than I probably are, need. Are you about, what I'm are you about totally going to tell a story, and you're going to have to listen. It so, better not be about my medical history. No, no, no. Okay. That was just a one-off. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That I posted on everybody. And, um, I'm still a little sunburned about he that. He is one. a little burnt about yeah. that. Um, so one time, I, there are times that I try to go into just the normal world outside and just give a little bit of like, I want, if you're having a hard day, if you know you're getting checked out at a, um, at a grocery store or at a restaurant and they are just, you can just see on their face, they're done. Um, you don't have to like have a big conversation, but sometimes I'm just like, Hey, how you doing? You know? And you can just tell, Oh, you know, so I sometimes would just have a conversation. I'm like, Oh, do you get to get off soon? Like, do you get to leave soon? And sometimes they're like, oh, no, I just started the day. And I'll be like, oh, you can do it. Only a few hours left. Or, yeah, you have like 15 minutes. Good for you. And then I leave. Now, that's it. And um, I'm in Sonic. And the line was so long. And it was taking forever as Tim, you know, it's always long. I know. But I love it, so I have to go through it. So we're waiting in the line for long. And the guy getting it, he was just like, is this your drink? I'm sorry. I don't know what drink it is. I'm all messed up. And I was like, that's OK. I was like, just go ahead and give it to me. And he was a young guy. And um, I thought, he looked really tired. And so I was going to use my normal conversation of like, hey, you know, hope, you're, hope your day's almost done. And then I was, in my mind, it made sense for me to say this. But I said, hey, well, when do you get off? Do you get off soon? And he was like, looked at me for a minute. And he was like, no. And, I, and I, then I thought, that totally did not come out how I wanted it to come out. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just hoping that you get to get off soon and go have fun with all your young friends. Nah, <laughs> I'm going to just drive off now. But again, it was, <laughs> if you can have the mentality of just trying to make someone feel like you see them and you see them for where they are, no matter where they are, then I feel like it's okay. And I feel forgiven for that. And I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't go to I don't Sonic said, anymore. <laughs> but it's, it's okay. Yeah. But hey, the pastor's wife making it weird. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Always. Always make it work. All right, thank you. Um, can we thank her? It's amazing. And again, that, you guys, that's that's why I had her share is because she she just tells, she comes home and she's like, "Here's what happened today," and and it's all the time. And I want you to know that you have that opportunity as well. Um, so band, come on up. Um, 
I got a couple more things I want to say, but if you guys are up here to make me talk faster. (laughs) One of the things that feels really important is we're talking about adventure being out there, and we're talking about you being creative and you recognizing that all of these next step moments are right in front of you if you're just on your toes. If you're realizing that you're a sent one in all of these different cross-cultural environments, and it can be everything from standing in line uh, at the grocery store to being in line at Sonic or at your workplace or at a park this afternoon or wherever it would be. If you have in mind that you're a sent one and that adventure is possible, it is also important to frame your expectations appropriately. And Jesus does that starting in verse 16 and for a while basically just goes on to say, be on your guard. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. You're going to get ridiculed. You're going to be hated by everyone because of me. You're going to be called the devil because I have been called the devil. And if you're followers of me, then why wouldn't it make sense that followers of the devil are going to be called the devil as well? So have your expectations properly set. Adventure is out there, and it's going to be really hard. The reason I want to bring bring that up, and I think Janet did a great job of talking this out too, is I think there are a lot of times that we as Christians, we as the church of the United States, have been way more interested in certain culture war contexts to change the landscape so that it's easier for us to be Christians than recognizing that's not what Jesus has asked us to do. What Jesus has asked us to do is to proclaim the kingdom of God is near and then demonstrate what the kingdom of God looks like. Not to till the soil so that people are, are, are nice to us when we say our stuff or that when we say Merry Christmas, they say Merry Christmas back. Or uh, with certain books that are get to stay inside the school versus not, or conversations around race, all of these things, if held in proper context, absolutely, we want to be change agents in these spaces as they pertain to the kingdom of God. But the second that it becomes about us, we are missing the point. And Jesus is very clear here. When you do this on my behalf, it is going to be difficult. Adventures out there. You're going to have some incredible experiences. Remember the first century church. Remember 60 AD. They would have been talking about all of these wild things that have been going on. Recognize what's getting ready to happen. Jerusalem is about to be sacked, and so many of them are about to die a martyr's death. Literally, Jesus is talking to 12 people, and every one of them we know died as a martyr. Adventure is out there, and it is going to be incredibly hard. So what on earth do we do? Well, thank God that in verse 26, he starts to have a completely different conversation with them to say, so don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid, even though all of this wildness is going to be taking place in the middle of your proclamation and your demonstration. And what's true, and the reason you don't need to be afraid, is because I'm with you. I love in verse 30, the very hairs on your head are numbered. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than a sparrow. And a sparrow back in that day was literally the cheapest commodity that was in their known society. And so Jesus says, I am sending you. You are sent. You sitting in these chairs right now, as you get ready to leave this space, you are sent. Those of you who are followers of Jesus, you are sent. Those of you sitting here who are not followers of Jesus, we are sent to you. And we're sent to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And then to demonstrate what that gets to look like. It looks like love. It looks like generosity. It looks like kindness. It looks like grace. And in so doing, we recognize and we have our expectations set properly that it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. And what we're not here to do is to change the circumstances so that it's less hard. It's to lean into who it is that we're next to. Where has our authority been given? It hasn't been given by society. It hasn't been given by our theology. It hasn't been given by all the good stuff that we've done up to this point. Our authority has been given by Jesus. So stick close to him. Recognize where it comes from. 
so that when you get to these last verses in verses 30 and 31, what Jesus gets to say to you is you're known. You're sent. It's going to be hard, and you're known. You're sent. It's going to be hard, and your deepest needs are going to be met. Again, what Jesus is not saying here is that it's like it's going to be hard, but it's going to be okay. These people all died. Horrible deaths. It has to be okay in a different way for this to be true, and it is. The deepest things, the things that are eternal, those are the things that matter. Adventure is out there. If we live to send people, I am convinced that we would be more on our toes. We'd be more responsive to prayer. We'd be more responsive to love. We would recognize that we don't need to change someone else's language for us to be able to talk about the language of the kingdom. We are it. And as we are it, all people are drawn to Jesus. It's not about us. And so I want us to stand. I want us to worship. I want you to go get prayer. I want you to sing your guts out. I want you to to have a conversation with God right now about what does this look like for me? Do I feel sent every moment of every day? And if you don't, I want to pray that you would know that. I want to pray that you believe it. If you're interested in following Jesus, we would love to have that conversation with you. We've got prayer team people over here that would love to pray with you about anything that's been going on specific to what we're talking about or anything else. You're most welcome to get prayer for anything. And these people love Jesus and they love you. And so they'll pray. So let's worship, let's pray, and let's recognize and and worship into the idea that we are sent.